Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the Lord Regent's secretary's personal assistant's coffee-fetching intern, and today it's time for episode 3 of me playing Dishonored. Um, really quick heads up, I am extremely ill at the moment, so uh, my voice might get fucked up, I'm not sure. It's a mystery, I'm super ill, please stop looking at me Sam, that's making me uncomfortable, just the dead-eyed, unblinking stare directly into my own eyes. Um, I'm just, I'm just gonna look, not look at him for a sec. Oh, wow. Well. Um, so yeah, I'm also going to be upgrading my PC in the next few days, so that should be fine. However, conceivably next week there might be some interruption to episodes um, if I get technical difficulties. But um, that shouldn't last more than a few days. We should be good. It should all be fine. Go follow me on Twitter if you want actual updates and to be able to keep track of things. Uh, yeah, so that's everything. Let's go. So I kind of broke this um, chapter in the weirdest place possible. Get in! We've got a hot meal and a warm bed waiting for you. Which, I'm not sure why I made that decision. I'm sure it made sense to me at the time, but um, probably would have been better to actually just finish this. Anyway, uh, yeah, so as you can see, I killed five people, which is a lot more than I wanted to, but that wasn't enough to cause chaos. Um, there's a, one of these screens at the end of every chapter. It lists hostiles, civilians, alarms rung, bodies found, overall total chaos, whether or not you killed anyone, whether or not you got ghost. There is actually an achievement for completing the game without killing anyone and one for completing the game without ever being detected. I'm not sure if there's an achievement for, for getting both on the same playthrough, but I just want to flex and say that I have actually done that. Um, there's also like special one-off plot things that you can do as like side quests and so on so that's these then over here runes bone charms shrines sokolov paintings and coins that you found during the chapter there's always about 20 percent of the coins that you don't find for reasons that i think i talked about in the past they're just hidden literally everywhere hidden allies hidden in an old bar on the river your new allies have plans to share with you meet with the loyalists in a circle to learn what they've got in mind This is the Hound Pits pub, closed for business. Half the district marked off is dead for the plague. Or right under the Lord Regent's nose, and he don't know a thing. Of course, if anyone finds out what we're up to, the watch will break in with swords drawn. And now that you've escaped, the Lord Regent's going to be tearing the city apart. Every time I'm about to say something, he interrupts Take me. Take to meet Admiral Havelock and the rest of the Loyalist. The Admiral's a man to be reckoned with. If anyone can help you find that missing girl, Lady Emily, and clear your name, he can. There's an interesting innocence to Samuel Beechworth. A lot of the characters in the game are very broad strokes, but then have kind of like some subtleties and depths, depths to them that I really like. Um, he kind of represents a, an almost Victorian concept of the noble working man, the kind of fellow who respects his betters and is good at heart and does the right things for the right reasons, but ain't ain't no smart, sir, etc. Um, but uh, that's subverted to some extent as you go along. So, yeah. One thing that I want to mention before we go any further into this place is just that um, the view here from the river actually lets you see almost all of the places that you visit in the game. Which is a nice touch, and it's a very kind of oops, immersive sim thing to do. Um, both to give you a hub to which you return between missions, and to give you some kind of um, conception of the ways these spaces interact with us. So that over there, that's where the final chapter of the game takes place. That's King Sparrow Island out in the in the bay. Um, this is, that's the palace. That's the prison we escaped from previously. That over there is the clock tower, which marks a wealthy district we visit later. And that is, I think, Caldwin's Bridge, which we also visit later. Um, so you can generally figure out where you are in the city based on these landmarks that you can see from the river. It's very well observed and um, feels very much like any of the you know great cities based around vast rivers that exist in the world. 
And that attention to detail is present pretty much everywhere in the game. Um, almost all of its spaces have been very carefully handcrafted with tons of incidental detail and little just components that make it feel like living, breathing spaces. This feels like a real place to me in a way that places in a lot of games don't. And it comes down to how carefully placed all of the just incidental stuff is. Um, it creates a very layered and detailed environment. So when I'm playing casually, what I do right in this moment is normally run around, grab everything that's not nailed down, because there's a ton of collectible stuff in this area, um, as you can see. But uh, that kind of makes some strange things be the case about Corvo. So what I'm going to do right now is actually take care of the plot stuff first and then run around getting a hold of... I expect they're hard at work in there. Best join them. Any uh, well, valuables that aren't nailed down. Really killed the so it's starting at last, Admiral. We found our man. Even after six months in Cold Ridge Prison, he slipped out like it was nothing. We can continue this later, Lord Pendleton. The man of the hour is here. Corvo, I'm Admiral Havelock. A true servant of the Empire, like you. Until the Lord Regent purged those of us who wouldn't recognize his claim on the throne. And I'm Lord Trevor Pendleton. I represent the nobility in our little group. But we all act as equals here at the Hound Pits pub. This is a momentous occasion, Corvo. I'm going to come out with it. We've been building a coalition of loyalists, aimed at ending the Lord Regent's tyranny and restoring the throne. At risk of execution, we're committed to finding young Lady Emily and seeing her crowned as Empress. We've got big plans, but we can't do any of it without you. We need your skills, your ability in a fight, and in helping us, we're going to help you destroy the men who murdered the Empress. Sorry, you must be exhausted. We can discuss this further after you've recovered. But before you retire, you should introduce yourself to Piero. He's challenging at times, but his industrious mind buys him that right. Yes, Piero's as much an artist as a technician. He's going to be crafting the gear you'll need. Go talk to him and then get some sleep. We can talk more when you've rested. Well, that seems fairly straightforward. Um, there's definitely stuff to say about this game's political attitudes because the setting they've created very intentionally has a lot of discussion of class issues. Um, but it is also a game ultimately about restoring a bloodline-based aristocracy because that's the only way that this world can have a good leader who actually cares about the people. And um, this conception of this like noble king is kind of really common in games as a rule and it's worth talking about but I'm not going to do that right now that is a topic I will be returning to later. Right now what I want to do is run around and explore all these spaces. Also one thing I really appreciate is that clearly a lot of um, research has gone into um, historical styles of adverts which is just River delightful. Traffic is forbidden from landing in the distillery district due to risk of infection. Contact. Violators will be taken to the flooded district for treatment. Right, now that that's quiet, I can get back to what I was saying. Um, I wonder if that will be replaced in later chapters. Some things change occasionally um, when you return here to the Hound Pits pub between chapters. Mostly, um, mostly it doesn't. There's very few changes that actually happen. They're mostly limited to Piero's workshop and a couple of places where, for example, new notes will appear. But yeah, so we have um, an endearingly believable location here with the Hound Pits pub, uh, a workshop and a distillery attached, or brewery, I guess. I guess the only difference is whether or not it brews or distills things. Anyway, um, you can introduce yourself to everybody. My, you must be Corvo. I am Lydia, at your service. Your room is upstairs and ready. When they told me who it was, well, I thought you'd be older, like the Admiral. You can also steal their keys. I'm sorry or not. it's so dark. We can't risk being seen. It is a bit romantic, though, isn't it? It's kind of an endearing attitude. Um, so there's a tiny handful of personalities who live here, and they all... You learn about them as you go. I should be able to steal her key. I used to be the hostess here. Nope. Oh, I could tell you stories about that, believe me. Anyway, um, you get to know these characters quite well over what is re a really short amount of time spent with them. 
Um, something I think the game pulls off very well is that kind of quick um, sketching of a personality so that you understand who they are instantly, but then slowly learn the nuances of that and uh, a bit more development as to who they are as people and how they relate to one another as individuals sharing a kind of a revolutionary sh cell. Although how revolutionary a revolutionary, revolutionary cell could really be when their goal is to, again, restore the aristocracy and they are funded by the aristocracy and by uh, part of the military. So, yeah. There's not tons to say, it's just kind of delightful to soak up the ambience. But one thing that does amuse me is that because my default way of playing whenever I enter this area for the first time on a casual playthrough is to um, essentially ignore the plot, um, explore the entire area, run around, find all of these little items that are worth money, and then um, climb to the very top of the building, break in through my own window, uh, or what will be my window after I'm given a bedroom, which is up there, and um, essentially just then come walking down the stairs like I own the place. I think it's quite funny. Because um, there is a lot of ludonarrative dissonance in immersive sims generally and in Dishonored especially, because the way people talk about you, and it's worth noting that that little aside that you can overhear when you approach the, the two downstairs plus entering that area, um, that line actually changes based on um, what you hear. Sorry, no, how you behaved in the previous mission. If you kill a lot of people, they say, geez, he killed a lot of people. Good thing we needed a killer. Not in those words, but that's what they say. And in it, because I snuck, they say, well, he's sneaky, we need a sneaky guy. So I'm not going to read all of these because there's a lot of them and I don't want this Let's Play to take six years. But there are a lot of law books scattered around. This is a quote from a speech from a historical event that resulted in the founding of the main religion in the area, the Abbey of the the Abbey of the Everyman. This is part two. I won't read that till we've read part one. Finding my way by the feeble light of the dying fire, I saw her working. A large needle moved in her hand, following precise esoteric patterns, knots and loops of seamstress craft from ancient days. Beneath her needle, his body clenched and shuddered, shaking the wooden table. A morbid fascination pulled me closer until she turned her blank face towards me, resting the needle on his flesh. With a refined tone, she addressed me. So you are the lover, I presume. You too have been unfaithful, and now it is your turn to be mended. So, there are a lot of um, little text, like, books around and other textural details that you can have that add texture to the nature of uh, the setting. It's quite funny to me that here, in the bathroom, I think it must be an intentional joke, this, the only bathroom in the building, has... Uh, the only book in the game which could really be described as being uh, vaguely pornographic. It's not pornographic, but um, it's an excerpt from a play, so presumably the rest of the play gets saucier. Which, interestingly, um, evinces bisexuality as being something that exists. It's at least, um, you know, something that is present in this world, although we don't know whether or not that it is considered acceptable. Um, the game elides a lot of these social issues, deciding to comment on some social issues rather than others, which is something I will return to as we go. Anyway, let's listen to this. Log entry one four. Or not. There we go. Log entry one four. Seems we have moved to a new phase. Martin's improvisations have borne fruit. And the former bodyguard has been freed and is en route to the staging location. Pendleton's voting block and my military connections. All we've lacked is the ability to project lethal force in a controlled manner against a previously inaccessible... Ah, to the Oops, I didn't mean to end that, but he doesn't say much more after this. Havelock Entry 1. It has been days since our men were dispatched to stash weapons for Corvo in the old sewer. They have not returned, so I can only hope that they succeeded in getting the packages delivered. Pierre has spent considerable time and resources making those things. If I could find a way to mass-produce them, the Dunwall Navy would secure its place as the dominant force on the globe. But back to Corvo. Can he actually break out of Coldridge? And if so, will he make his way here? Personally, I give him odds of 1 in 5. So, um, yeah, you can learn a lot about the people by the places that they live. This is Havelock's room. It's clearly the nicest room here, which makes sense because he owns the place, which we'll find out later. Um... But also, we know that he is 
a man of letters, he's an intelligent man, or at least wants to appear so, because he has all these books, and that's what those mean semiotically. But we also know this is the only time in the game where we see this like medals panel, so it's very clearly tied to him. He's proud of his of his history as a military man. He's proud of his position as a military man. And um, he's clearly very loyal to the state. If I may, I am the personal assistant to Lord Pendleton, and one of the senior servants at Pendleton House, as was my father. Now I am entrusted with this house, the home of the Loyalists. I have never seen the Admiral fail at any venture. If order can be restored to the city of Dunwall, I believe he can do it. If anyone can get your old life back, it's him. As we go along, we'll see an interesting contrast between this guy and um, Samuel Beechworth. Because Wallace is absolutely a company man, in, or I guess, kind of a feudal sense. He absolutely is devoted to um, his betters in a kind of a Victorian ideal, um, the way that the upper classes in Victorian society felt about the people below them was that they should be these obedient and loyal um, entities that serve them. Pleased to meet you, Master Corvo. I saw you at court in happier days. But you might not remember. I was once a close ally to the Lord Regent, Hiram Burroughs, back when he was just the spy master. He's one manipulative bastard, I can tell you that. So in contrast to Admiral Havelock, who is ostensibly a man of honour, a man who is devoted to his cause and to his nation, we have Trevor Pendleton, a very tangled up, bitter little aristocrat. Nothing lies in that heart other than slowly stewing poisonous hatred for his family and for the world that has, in his eyes, constantly screwed him over. My furnishings have been installed at last with no small amount of complaining by that antiquated boatman. The others have no idea what it's like to suffer as I have. Speaking of which... Wallace, please breathe two bottles of Dunwall Red, never mind which, and fetch a clean glass. <sighs> well, I'll begin again tomorrow. I would comment on the paintings in each person's room and how they might reflect their personality, but there's only about eight paintings in the entire game, not counting the unique Sokolov portraits. So while I do have things to say about those paintings with regards to what they represent about the society that has created them, um, I don't think it's worth commenting on <laughs> whether or not they mean something about the person who, you know, keeps them in their environment, because uh, almost everybody has several of the same paintings. That said, you could talk about the kind of a sense of optimism from the, you know, thrilling Victorian scenes of industry presented in, in Trevor Pendleton's room as compared to the kind of like menacing landscapes that Havelock seems to prefer. Uh, there's a couple more things to grab and then we'll talk to Piero. But uh, I mentioned ludonarrative dissonance earlier. For anyone who doesn't know, this is the concept of... Um, one of the key things about storytelling in games is keeping you immersed. It is... Did I come over here already? I must have done. There's normally some uh, ore washed up on the on the beach to take. So this idea that um, if you can I get back up? Yeah. That uh, to tell a story in the video game medium, you need to maintain immersion. You need to maintain um, the suspension of disbelief in the eyes of the player. There's a lot of tricks that are done to do the, to achieve this, and it's not that difficult to keep someone immersed. Um, one of the most skillful ways of doing this is by simply providing a high degree of embodiment, and Dishonored does better than many games with regards to that. You have a physical presence, you can kick things off tables if you're not careful, um, you know, you can chin up onto staircases and so on, you're not just a kind of a floating camera with a gun attached. However, um, one of the issues with that is simply that the way that people react to you in the world is a much stronger indicator of who you are and whether or not you are a real person. And one of the issues with games is that you can completely destroy that immersion for yourself by the way you behave. It doesn't make sense for the narrative that Corvo is the kind of person who jumps on the table and spins around. Um, or if you do take those um, player activities as what you might call um, characterizations as well, <laughs> Uh, this game becomes a portrait of a very peculiar man. Corvo is the is, Corvo is the man who scuttles. He creeps around. He sneaks up behind people. Um, when his allies are looking in the wrong oh hi, in the wrong direction, he picks their pockets. They watch him crawl under tables for no reason, or jump up roofs, or just do very peculiar things. 
The Admiral served in the Navy under the Empress. But something happened with the Lord Regent that drove the Admiral out. If I understand it right. Cecilia, you are the only one I respect here other than Sam, I've got to say. Um, oh, I missed a coin. That was close. Oh, it was worth ten. So there's a window I can hop out of here, which shows us the final area other than Piero's workshop to show off about this zone. So later on, once, once, uh, big spoilers, I guess, but this game came out ten years ago. Uh, once you rescue Lady Emily, you bring her back here and, uh, this is her room. The Fuge Feast. At the end of every year, after the last day of the month of songs, we begin the Fuge Feast. The new year has not started, and thus the time that follows is outside the calendar. A period of celebration and feasting begins, during which the people abandon the very practices that keep them whole and healthy for, for the rest of the year. Many leave their homes euphoric with spirits or potent herbs. Some paint their faces or wear masks to conceal themselves as they pursue their passions without reservation. When the right cosmological signs are observed and it is time for the calendar to begin anew, the sitting high overseer calls for the hymn of atonement and the fuge feast ends. Families return to their homes, wives to their husbands, enemies put down their weapons and fires are extinguished. No complaint is given for those who have wronged others, deviated from ancient codes or discarded oaths. For this time during the astrological alignment does not exist and is not recorded. The following day starts the new year, marketed on the first day of the month of Earth, as it has always been. So, one of the interesting things about this game is that they have put a lot of effort into the world building and figuring out the ways that uh, this society might differ from our own. And um, how you can have this society in a fantasy world that is very, very reflective of the late 16, mid 17 and mid 1800s as a society. As I said before, they do draw their influences very widely. Um, there are, you know, Regency um, influences from the, you know, mid to late 1700s. There are strong, strong Victorian influences, but there's also a, a fair bit of uh, the Edwardian stuff coming in from later on. So yeah, this returning issue of ludonarrative dissonance is just a problem throughout games like this. It's clearer in some games than others, but I think that when your artwork is trying to achieve something in particular, so if your if your work if your game is intending to be more immersive than the average game, um, then there is a much higher bar that you have to reach with regards to not causing that feeling of ludonarrative dissonance. Um, and I think that um, Dishonored does very well in terms of the textural detail of its environments, and in terms of the characters' interactions with each other. The only issue is that. Playing the way most people play this game, Corvo is a bizarre man and nobody comments on it, ever. Nobody sees you walk into their room, eat their pie off their desk, pick their pocket and then play their audio diary in front of them. With that, they just take it in stride completely. I'll be crafting your weapons and gear. All custom work. For you, I will create the tools of a master assassin. And now the tank of whale oil is running. Will you get a new tank from upstairs, please, while I hold this in place? Be careful. The oil's unstable. When it explodes, there is a terrible mess. Oh, really? Seems fine to me. Um, well, it's empty. So, yeah. Uh, um, Piero is one of the main recurring characters in the game. He's kind of interesting. I'm not entirely Spencer sure. Stairs will provide you with a fresh tank of whale oil. They're heavy, but you are no doubt strong enough to carry one back down here if you would. Oh, there's one there already. So let's just nickel his stuff while we're here as well. The Academy teaches that absurd idea that the energy in whale oil arises from the need to maintain life functions at extreme ocean depths. The pressure in the cold are too much to endure without it. I speculate that a human being might, by a process of adaptation, produce high energy humors in the body. I could build a tank that would slowly increase pressure on a subject over a long period of time and then observe them for years if need be to see if the formulation of energetic substances develop. Surely the Empress would be able to furnish me with facilities. Just the necessary legal amnesty. Astonishing! 
<laughs> Piero is the only one who seems amused by your behavior. Um, so yeah, Piero's uh, absolute amorality in regards to his pursuit of science or natural philosophy is clear from minute one here. He is perfectly happy to um, do illegal and immoral experiments on people. This is not particularly interesting, that just tells us how these machines work. These whale oil things I will read the next time we come back here. I think probably the smartest thing to do is... What I'm doing right now is essentially um, finding everything there is to find, which takes a while, Perfect. so... Now plug it in. That'll be the content of this episode, and then Just when we come back here... Near the receptacle. Magnetism will do the rest. Shut up, Piero, I'm busy. Um, and then when we come back here on between other chapters, I'm going to do things like read books and talk about the characters, now that we've seen every area and found all of the trash that there is to gather up. Perfect. Thank you, Cole. Here, see? The Assassin's Mask. You're a wanted man, so everyone in the city knows your face, but this mask will mean terror to them. If you just hold still, fit must be precise. There. Can you see normally? Center lens out of the line. There. Better now? I could create more for you. Upgrades for your gear, weapons, munitions. But our situation here is desperate. Scavenge the city for valuables, and I will resell them on the black market. That should give us the money to craft the things you need. Tell me what I can make for you. So, uh, yep, he's your recurring merchant. He sells the upgrades to the various equipments that you'll be using throughout the game, and he also uh, sells some refills. I feel like he definitely has the energy of a... Um, have you ever met a really put-upon engineer who's frustrated by the way that uh, the people in charge of their goals is just like, never provides funding, never does any of the things you need them to do, uh, and it's all terrible, and uh, if only they would give me the funding! Basically, um, that's Piero, in a nutshell, as we will find out in a moment. So, because we're playing non-lethally, most of the upgrades in the game will be completely irrelevant. The crossbow is the only non-lethal ranged weapon, and none of the other tools can be used non-lethally, so there's no point upgrading bullet capacity or bolt capacity. Bolts can be used to distract guards, which is useful, but aside from um, the crossbow upgrades and the bone charm capacities and things like mask optics and some other upgrades that we'll unlock later, they really- must be exhausted. I advise that you get some sleep. Your life will get even more difficult soon. You should rest while you can. Uh, I will do that in Very a minute. Very well. You know best. Let me know if you need anything more. It's interesting, the idea- the, there was a very Victorian concept. By the way, this is how you know that Piero is that kind of put-upon personality. I'm not going to read this out in full, but this is a message from the Admiral basically saying, you keep asking for really expensive ingredients for your machines. Um, how about no? How about non-expensive ingredients for you? How about uh, you just make do with what you have? There is a consistent trend in the world, in history, etc. once served under Admiral Havelock. Captain Havelock then. I don't know if he remembers me, but I fear it's rude to ask. I don't want to embarrass him where the people in charge say, we want X to happen. And you say, okay, in order to achieve X, I will need Y money, because that is how much it takes to do that thing. And they say, that's insane. We will give you Z money, which is half as much. And you say, that's impossible. And they say, do it anyway. So yeah, that's that. Um, I will also be, I, I will be talking about these characters and who they are to each other and um, so on as we go along. But I think for now, we should probably head to bed. Because there is one more character for us to meet, and you will meet him next episode, after I eventually remember where the hell my bed is. Yes, very much so, but no need to fear. He is here to work with our masters. People say he killed the Empress. Of course he didn't. People are foolish and believe whatever they're told. Okay. If the Admiral trusts him, then so will I. 
So yeah, there's all of these incidental conversations that you can stumble across in various parts of the game as well, which obviously give texture. They, um, the way people say the things they say tells you a lot about them as well as the things that they say. So all of these components together result in... that These characters are not subtle or deep, but they are well-rounded and well-designed to be who they are, to be who, who the narrative needs them to be. And I think that that is... The real skill of um, characterization in a in game design is basically how you make a character be clear as a person to the player as fast as possible. Because you really have way less time to develop that sort of thing than you might in a book. Anyway, uh, we're going to go to sleep and that will be the end for today. By which I mean we'll go to sleep at the start of the next uh, next video. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.